thank you all for coming. It's uh, interesting to see how many people are interested in something that happened 20 odd years ago. I'd, I'd like to, to start off at, at the bottom of, of this screen, you'll see there's uh, a hashtag and, uh, and the Twitter address of, uh, of Gresham College. Please feel free to tweet during Gresham lectures. We're trying to encourage more use of social media in order to get more people recognizing that the lectures are happening and getting involved with them and watching them afterwards. So if you would like to, to use your, your phones, please keep them on silence. But nevertheless, um, feel, feel free to, uh, to use them and, and to tweet. Or even you know, if, if you're a Periscope user, go ahead and live stream. I mean, that's, that's absolutely fine. It's, it's hard to remember, perhaps, but 20 years ago, um, we were all, many of us anyway, lots and lots of us, were really quite concerned about what was about to happen. And it, it's hard, really, to, to think back to those times because it, it's a long time ago and because somehow it seemed so unrealistic. But those of us who were there, those of us who were involved in the work that was being done to try to, to identify and fix the various issues around the century date change problem, the millennium bug, uh, we remember it reasonably clearly, and, and it was real enough. There was a lot going on, and there were lots of, of warnings, books, headlines. It, it was a software problem that could be a common point of failure for a lot of systems. So although we were used to software problems, we weren't used to having a software problem that might cause a lot of systems to fail at or around the same time. And, and that was a serious concern, you know, particularly to people like the, the banks and to governments. There were serious fears that it would actually cause a big failure of national infrastructure, that power would fail, that bank accounts would be wiped out, and that, that um, both credit balances and debts would just vanish. There were even quite a lot of, of people who, because it was the millennium, saw it as, as a, a major religious event or a, a major event that suggested that the end of the world was coming. And, and just to give you a flavour for it, these are some of the things that that were actually being published, books and, and newspaper articles and magazine articles. <laughs> the, the survival guides became quite popular. There, there was a strong survivalist movement in America which started um, using this as a, an example of how to survive all kinds of, of cataclysms. There were, there were even special cookery <laughs> books for, for how to deal how, how to survive in an environment where you wouldn't be able to buy things because it was assumed that the shops wouldn't be functioning, the supply chains could well have broken down. And as I say, there, there were serious millennium cults and um, cataclysmic cults that, that believed that it was the end of the world. People literally decamped into, into the hills and and into deep forests because they, they thought that the end of the world was happening and they wanted to be spiritually prepared for that. And with all that going on, it took a while for action to be taken. Gradually, things started to build up. Awareness was, was low of what the issue really was at the beginning, and so there were awareness campaigns, and the government got involved, the United Nations started taking action, the World Bank started taking action, companies um, were a bit ahead of, of governments and the World Bank actually, but, but gradually certainly the big companies started to, to get things done. And, and the th one of the things that really started to make people move rapidly was when the auditors uh, agreed, the, the big six auditors as they were at the time, uh, agreed that they weren't going necessarily going to be able to sign off accounts on a continuing business basis unless they had got assurance for the, from the company that all their critical systems had been signed off 
as compliant with, with year 2000 standards and, and therefore reasonably guaranteed not to fail at, at the end of the century. And, and that really frightened people because you know, the finance director started to get worried and then the board started to get worried and then they got some resources. And then we got to the day before the, the end of the century and, and this, was, this was the sense and, and then this was the sense. And there was a feeling of anticlimax. There was a feeling that maybe all, all that money, all that effort, all that fear had been unnecessary, that uh, it was all a hoax. People started suggesting that it had been all constructed by consultants who wanted to make money or, or by companies that wanted to sell new versions of their equipment or for other reasons. <coughs> and to an extent, that's the message that has carried on to today. The only time you really hear about, about Y2K these days is when somebody's laughing at it or using it as an example of, you can't believe the experts. And so what I want to do in this lecture is to give you the ability to counter that if you agree with me that actually this was much more than a hoax, much more than, than a scam. It was actually a, a signal event. It was a, a near miss that ought to warn us about things that we, we mustn't do again and things that we must do again. And if we don't learn the right lessons, then obviously we're in danger of, of repeating some of the calamities that, that could have occurred. So I want to run through, through these things. I want to look at what the issues were, uh, and I'll look at, at six date-related problems around the, the turn of, of the millennium, uh, all of them essentially the, the same problem, but with different manifestations, or all but one of them the same problem, but with different manifestations. I want to look at how it was that we came to see to realise that, that this problem really existed, and then to look at what needed to be done, how it needed to be done, and finally right through to uh, what actually happened and what lessons were learned and what lessons perhaps weren't learned. And these are the, the six issues, and I'll go through them one at a time, uh, but fairly quickly, you'll be pleased to hear. But it's worth remembering, this was often seen as a technical problem. But it wasn't. It was a business problem because it was a serious risk that you could not insure. There was, there was no significant amount of insurance for the knock-on effects of, of year 2000 at the time. And there's an echo of that in the cybersecurity problem now because it's very difficult to get useful insurance for, for cybersecurity failures. Um, companies will sell you cybersecurity insurance, but um, I wouldn't recommend trying to claim on it. And it was a business problem because of the scale of it. Uh, the, the figures here for the number of, of embedded systems, of, of microprocessor-based systems inside other bits of equipment, and the failure rates that were being detected shows the sort of scale just in the infrastructure systems. And then, of course, there were, there were all the commercial systems alongside it. And because it was a single point of failure for a lot of different systems, it was also a single point of failure for a lot of different organisations. So even if, if you survived as a company, your customers might fail or your suppliers might fail. And the people who were passing you data in a supply chain might pass you corrupt data and cause you to fail, even if your systems would have processed correct data correctly. So there were a lot of business-related issues that turned out to be much harder to fix than people expected. Now, the first problem was, was simply the, the lack of centuries in the dates that were being processed. And, of course, it's common. People, even today, people will talk about the 60s, they'll talk about the 20s. We know perfectly well what century they're talking about. And when space is short... Uh, even now, even after the year 2000, we leave the century off, as, as you can see happens on, on credit cards. And you, you, you only have to look at your bank card to see that 
that where space is tight, we don't bother to put the century on. So it wasn't surprising that in the early days of computing, where a lot of data was on punch, 80 column punched cards, for example, and when computer storage, magnetic storage, was extremely expensive and, and core storage, the, the um, random access memory in, in mainframe computers was extremely <coughs> expensive and, and very scarce, of course, people left the centuries <coughs> off. And the programmers at the time didn't expect that that would actually cause a problem. Firstly, because they didn't think that their, that, that their um, programs would last that long. Um, to, to actually meet a century change, and, and secondly, because actually people don't think about future problems of this sort of nature. It was just out of scope somehow. Alan Greenspan uh, of, of the Federal Reserve Bank um, actually told Congress that he was one of the, the people who caused the problem because he, he was a programmer. He, he wrote code. And he didn't document it particularly well, and he needed to save space. He says that they, they went through a, a design phase of actually working out how they could squeeze more space out of the data in order to be able to be more efficient. So he was one of the people who created the problem. Almost every system that used dates was affected because the, the, the real heart of the problem was that the moment you do comparisons or arithmetic on date ranges that span the change of century, you get the wrong answers. And we'll see one or two examples of that in, in a moment. But what you tend to get is, is zeros or negative values rather than the values that you're expecting. Or you get values that are 100 years out. And those comparisons are very, very common. In, in the bottom half of this slide, you can see the sort of systems in which you find date handling. And it's almost everywhere. It's almost all commercial systems, and even today, of course, most commercial systems process dates, and most date processing involves doing date comparisons of, of ranges of dates. But systems that have to worry about expiry dates on security cards or um, service intervals on, on lifts, on elevators, on escalators, and, and where there is a legal requirement to shut them down if they haven't been serviced within a particular period of time. Those sorts of systems were also vulnerable. Um, systems that, that were producing trend data for, for monitoring process equipment, for example, in factories. Lots and lots and lots of systems. One of the early failures um, that was actually the, the outfall gates on a major sewage processing plant, uh, which, which caused an environmental problem when the, when the systems failed. That was the biggest problem and the root problem, but the second biggest problem was that PCs were going to fail. Lots and lots of PCs weren't going to work. The early PCs had very rudimentary clocks. They didn't maintain the, the, the initial IBM PC, didn't, didn't maintain the, the date at all. If you turned it off and then turned it back on again, uh, it had lost the date that, that had been maintained. So you had to type in the date every time you booted the, the PC. That was, that was considered not, not to be very helpful. And so uh, the next generation of IBM PCs, the, the PC XT, um, actually started to preserve the, the date and then the century. But the way that it was done, and you'll see a lot of the detail of this in the transcript if you want to follow it through, the way that it was done led, led to problems. Um, in, in particular, it, it, it didn't always get it right under some circumstances, and, and then it fed the wrong date or the wrong century to, to DOS, which was the... PC operating system uh, at the time, and then, and then to Windows, which had been built on top of DOS and suffered from many of the same problems. DOS assumed that all dates were between 1980 and 2099, and, and if it got a date it didn't like, it reset it the 1st of April uh, 1980. And that was a, um, a symptom that occurred with a lot of computers. If you tried to um, 
to start up a, a PC and gave it a date in the 21st century, um, what you ended up with was DOS resetting the date to the, to the 1st of April 1980. And that causes all sorts of problems because you end up with lots of files, all of which have exactly the same wrong date. And it messes up all your backup cycles and it, it just creates all kinds of administrative problems. And that was just that issue with DOS. The, the BIOSes, the built-in operating systems that actually drove, drove the hardware and on, on top of which the, the um, operating system was, was written, um, they, they failed in all kinds of, of silly ways and some of them quite catastrophically. Uh, and again, there are examples of particular BIOSes and particular failures in the transcript and I've given references for these things as usual. But and there was one, one BIOS which uh, would not accept a date um, that was, was outside the 1990s. And uh, if you gave it a date outside, it failed in a way that could not be reset. You had to, had to actually put in a new BIOS chip in order to solve the problem. Uh, and since the BIOS chips weren't designed to be replaced, um, most people end up having to replace the, the computer in order to fix the problem. And even Windows 95 would, would fail uh, with, with dates that were outside this range. So a lot of people were, had moved to Windows 95, of course, in, in the mid-90s. Uh, and they, they were all having to, to upgrade ultimately to Windows 98, which was the first Windows version that was actually capable of handling dates successfully in the rollover and, and then in, in the new millennium. And it wasn't just a, a desktop processing issue because PCs were used very widely, rack mounted in process control for, for controlling all, all sorts of equipment by then. The other sorts of controllers were the programmable logic controllers, the, the PLCs, uh, typically part of networks connected into um, SCADA systems, system, supervisory systems that collect data from, from a lot of controllers and, and manage an entire factory. And they tend to have to process trend data on, on the various things that, that you're measuring across a complex factory. And so they ran into lots of, of problems as well because they were, they were processing dates and looking at ranges and doing calculations on dates. And so there was a, a serious Y2K problem there, and it was bad software. P PLC software was, was typically highly customized, unique to a particular installation and particular configuration, written in, in ladder logic, which um, there was a limited number of people who understood the the uh, programming language that, that was being used, and they were typically very, very badly documented. So uh, that caused quite a lot of difficulties for quite a lot of industrial companies. Four, five, and six. Um, 2000 was the first century leap year since 1600 uh, because of the, the somewhat arcane rules for what determines a leap year. So a lot of people thought that it actually wasn't a leap year because it was a century year, not realising that the fact that it divided by 400 made it a leap year again. So that was something that had to be checked. There, pro programmers are a creative lot, and, and in particular they're, they're pretty creative in, in constructing ways that, that make it look as though it's an easy solution to today's problem but store up trouble for the future. And one of the ways that programmers had been doing that was by using the century, uh, the, the year 99 as, a, as an end of file marker. Uh, you know, it was a year that was sufficiently far in the future that uh, it was a perfectly good way of, of telling a program that was reading a sequential file or a magnetic tape, for example, that you'd come to the end of the file and this was the last record. So as, as we started to get real dates that were going to be um, 1999, that started to be a significant issue that had to be fixed. Similarly, um, the, the year zero was, was used for special purposes, for example, to, to mark a, a record that had been processed, knowing that it would then be sorted to the front of the file and wouldn't get processed again. Those sort of tricks were, were reasonably widespread and, and, of course, they had to, all to be tracked down. 
Then there were fixed centuries on, on all kinds of things, you know, print routines, um, just automatically printed out, you know, 19 was built in as a constant. Printed stationery, there was lots of printed stationery that already had the 19 there, and you know, checkbooks, for example, already had the 19 there, all had to be replaced and updated, contract forms and so on, all of which had, had preset the century part of the date, all of which had to be done. This just added work that was all piling up against the same deadline. And it turned out that there were um, 50,000 or more people in America who, and, and presumably around, around the world elsewhere as well, but in America, who had already commissioned gravestones and had the century carved into the gravestone only to discover that they lived into the new century and, and the gravestones had to be adjusted. What, what sort of things alerted people? I mean, one of the earliest things was Marks and Spencer's re received uh, a delivery of corned beef that the stock control system rejected because uh, it expired in, in um, 2002 and appeared to be ne nearly 100 years old. <laughs> uh, so the stock control system sent it back. The, uh, um, the, the warehouse it had come from simply sent them another one, which was uh, then, of course, failed in exactly the same way. And they went, they went around this loop for a little while before appreciating just what the problem was. And, and another example, Mary, Mary Bandar, at the age of 104, was called in up and, and told that she had um, been allocated a place in an infant's class. <laughs> And we, we started to hit the fact that a lot of backup tapes had 999-day retention periods on them. And, and when that nine, 999 days ran into the, uh, into the new millennium, into the new century, uh, that started to cause backup system problems. It, it caused them to, to um, perform erroneous calculations and to start failing. So what do we need to do? What, what needed to be done? Uh, awareness first, because you couldn't get people investing the money that needed to be put in to fix the scale of the problems that existed unless they knew that they'd got a big problem. And really quite late on, a surprisingly large number of people really did not understand it. Uh, in, in 1996, with the support of the government, um, Task Force 2000 was set up as, a, as an awareness activity. Uh, it was chaired by Robin Gurnier, who's sitting in, in the front of the audience here and who's been helping me with, uh, with this lecture. Uh, and um, Michael Minelli of the Ministry of Defence and Rob Wersitz of the Computer Services Association, as I think it was called at, at the time, the, the trade organisation for, for the computing industry, um, were also very active in setting up and, and running that organisation. And it did a lot of good work. It was initially supported by the Conservative government who appreciated that something needed to be done. And then when the Labour Party came in in 1997, they decided that what was really needed was a, a fully government-backed programme. Uh, and they set up Action 2000 with, with a much larger budget and and started um, spending much more money than, than had been available before. As I mentioned earlier, the audit firms had woken up and, and they were giving lots of advice to their audit clients and that helped enormously. Um, the uh, G8, I think it was G8, might have been G7 at the time, uh, actually put it on the agenda for one of their main meetings in, in 1998 and that alerted companies and the United Nations and the World Bank finally set up the International Y2K Coordination Centre to manage the, the national programmes that had by now been set up in most developed countries and quite a lot of, of the developing countries with World Bank support. So there was a lot of coordination activity that went on. And interestingly, most of the papers of the uh, International Y2K Co Cooperation Centre are still on the internet in the internet archive sites. So you can actually go back and look at the reports and, and see what was going on in each, in each country at the time. The BSI produced a, an international standard, a national and then international standard 
for, for what you needed to do to be compliant, and they were the obvious things that, that you would expect. Uh, but it, it gave us a baseline that could be written into contracts, which was the important role of the standard. And the projects were, uh, they had a, a, a standard structure, and you had to, firstly, to find all your computing systems, uh, and then to produce a decent inventory of them, and to determine what you knew about them. And then, of course, you had to evaluate them to find out which of them had got a, a problem with, with uh, year 2000. And that was a major task. It, it involved a lot of scanning, um, people reading the code, people processing the source code uh, using special tools, people um, um, running tests, of course, in order to, uh, to, to see if the systems failed under, under various circumstances. And then you had to come up with a remediation scheme to fix the problems that you'd found. They had to be implemented, they had to be tested. You had to manage all the assets because you'd now got new versions of, of lots of things around. You needed to coordinate all the interrelationships between systems. It was the biggest IT project that most companies had ever faced. And most companies then, as now, were not good at bringing IT projects in on time. And this one had a fixed deadline. In fact, it had several deadlines, because although the year 2000 was in a known place, uh, until you'd really examined your program, you didn't know how early it would start failing, how early it would start encountering dates that were the other side of, of the new century and would therefore start to, to trigger failures. Many companies couldn't even find their source code. I remember talking to, to one um, FTSE 100 company, an audit, audit client, uh, a, and, and I had the finance directors of all the group companies in the room, about 60 of them, and I asked them, I, I asked anybody who, who uh, they were responsible for their IT systems, that was, that was the structure in that company, I, I said, I'd, I'd like you to put, put up your hand if you believe that for your most critical systems, you could, within the next month, rebuild those systems from the source code without introducing any errors just recreate the systems that are currently running on your computers by simply rebuilding them from the original sources. Nobody put their hand up. And it was the, the usual story. Oh, you know, we had this whiz programmer. He was terribly responsible, responsive to the users. He was always you know, working late at night, introducing new features for them. Did it all in his own file store, and now he's left, and we can't find any of it. The resources that were needed were scarce, so staff salaries went up. Uh, COBOL programmers were, were brought back in from retirement uh, and paid startling amounts of money. And because that was happening, uh, staff turnover went up because different companies were trying to get people who'd got the right skills, and people were poaching people from wherever they could find them. So there was a, a big problem of staff turnover and, and inflated salaries. What do you need to do? Well, there were various ways of fixing the problem. You could expand two-digit dates to, to uh, two-digit years to four, four-digit years. Um, a good solution, but, but an expensive thing to do and very easy to make mistakes with it. There was the windowing problem where you, you just change the, the solution, where you just change the date routines, those sort of processing dates, in order to infer what century you're talking about by looking at the particular year. Uh, you, know, you might say that, that if, if the year is, is bigger than, than 40 and, and um, less than... I can't, th can't think of a, of a good window that, that we're actually using, actually. But, but you can see that, that you, you can look at a, a particular year and guess what century it's likely to be in from context. And so that windowing process was, was used, but you needed to use the same window on all the systems that were connected and processing the same data, otherwise you were going to run into trouble. And you needed to make sure that you replaced those systems with a better solution before you hit the end of the window that you'd chosen. And I wouldn't mind betting there are still some systems out there that have, have actually um, put in windowing uh, solutions to the Y2K problem and which are approaching the end of their windows and, and failing. 
Uh, certainly that has been happening to a degree over the past years. And of course you, you could put in new systems and consultants advise this quite often because consultants you know, get, get paid a lot of money for helping companies to put in new systems. The, the suppliers liked it because they sold upgrades. Um, but most companies could not resist putting in new features when they did that. They didn't just want a system that did what, what they were doing before. And so they had to go through the whole requirements and, and they made the problem more complex. And then, as now, IT systems overran. So a lot of systems ran up against deadlines. The systems they were supposed to be replacing started to fail. The new system wasn't ready. There were a number of problems of that nature. Basic testing was easy. Um, these strategies work perfectly well. Um, unfortunately, um, it, it led to a, a range of, of issues, as, as we shall see in a moment, but you could run these sorts of tests if you were, if you were brave enough to do them with, with your critical systems. Um, Something started to go wrong in the 1990s. An aluminium plant in Western Australia failed at the end of the leap year in 1996 um, for reasons which I've explained in more detail in the transcript. Uh, it caused a, a complete catastrophic failure of that smelting plant. The, the system shut down and, and the plant was damaged almost irreparably. There was an identical plant running in New Zealand and luckily they managed to get the message to them before they hit exactly the same time of day. Uh, and they were able to shut the system down in a controlled manner and prevent the, the same issue occurring there. Chrysler at uh, Stirling Heights um, tested the rollover by, by actually taking their, the clocks that were controlling the systems in, in, in their large plant uh, and, and setting them and seeing what happened at the rollover. And, and the Chrysler chairman said, we, we got a lot of surprises. Um, the security systems wouldn't let anybody in or out. Uh, we couldn't pay anybody. And there was complete shutdown of, of the plant. And despite the fact that uh, most companies had really, by, by the end of the decade, done an immense amount of work on their systems, um, Raycal had a, a major issue in, in late 1999 where a lot of their uh, credit card systems uh, failed and, and caused a lot of their, um, the shops that were using those systems to, to lose a lot of trade by being unable to process payments. And the retailers claimed that, that they, they lost $5 million as a result of that. And, and certainly there was, a, there was a lawsuit I haven't investigated how much it was settled for, it probably isn't uh, published. What sort of things were, were caught and prevented? Um, interesting ones, you know, the, the UK uh, anti-aircraft missile defences turned out to, uh, to not work if, if they hadn't been fixed before the rollover. Uh, a Swedish nuclear plant was, was tested, luckily in the summer, and closed down. Uh, if that had happened in, in January, it would have caused a lot more problems because of, of the, the cold weather and the, the excess demand for, for electricity. Um, the man who was responsible for, for Y2K compliance for the Millennium Dome, and you'll re remember that, that the Millennium Dome had a, a major celebration with a lot of VIPs coming to it uh, to actually be there for, for the rollover. So those systems were politically very sensitive. Uh, when they, they first did a rollover test, the number of messages, the number of systems that failed and put messages on the console um, were failing so fast that they couldn't see what was going on. The, the messages just scrolled straight off the, the top of the screen and, and vanished. So they, they really had a lot of issues that they had to address and they put in a big team of people and, and addressed them and fixed them. Um, some consultants working for me were, were d helping BP Exploration with, with their year 2000 remediation. One of the errors that, that my team found, um, BP Explora Exploration said that finding that one error um, justified their entire year 2000 program, the, all the costs of their year 2000 program worldwide because of the impact that that would have had if it hadn't have been fixed on, on the platforms where that system had been installed. 
Um, 1.3 million Visa card systems uh, were found to fail. Uh, there were lots and lots and lots of failures in commercial systems that were found and, and fixed. And it was a massive exercise. Um, just doing the uh, work for General Motors in Europe, the, the Deloitte's consultancy team uh, had to hire an aircraft hangar, several hundred PCs, uh, commandeer um, a lot of local hotels in order to, to put up the people who were going to be working on it. It was like mobilising a small army. Um, actually just to handle that one client in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and then what, what actually happened after, after the millennium rollover? Uh, I, was, I was annoyed by the... I'd, I'd been... By this time, I'd, I'd left... I, I used to... Uh, for, for a number of years, I ran the Year 2000 programmes worldwide for Deloitte Consulting. Um, and... Um, I, after I left, I left Deloitte so in about um, 97, I started doing some work and, and took on the role of being the ultimate auditor for National Air Traffic Services. So I, I audited all the programmes that NATs were carrying out to check and remediate all the systems that National Air Traffic Services had, which was in, enormous fun, as you can imagine. I visited all, all sorts of exciting places. Um, climbed lots of interesting radars and things. But unfortunately, at 4 o'clock in the morning on January the 1st, the runway visual range system that, that works out the, uh, calculates and measures the visibilities on, on airfields um, failed on all the, all the NATS airfields because of a Y2K problem. It was a trivial problem. Um, they, the systems were, were programmed to, uh, to call into the main computer and do a health check at 4 o'clock every morning. Uh, and at four o'clock that morning, they called in, discovered that the two clocks were out of sync, uh, and shut down, because that was what they were programmed to do for safety reasons. Uh, it didn't cause any problems. Nobody was flying. In fact, we had Nats had a um, a task force sitting in a in a, a, a room monitoring what was going on around all the UK airspace, and they got a phone call late in the evening of December the thirty first from the. Um, air traffic controllers in Scotland saying that the radars had failed because they were getting no echoes whatsoever from any aircraft. And it turned out they weren't the aircraft. Um, people had decided they just weren't going to fly, and so there weren't any aircraft in, in, the, uh, in the airspace for the radars to pick up. Lots of uh, faults were... Um, reported by, by the uh, Y2K Coordination Centre. I've, I've listed about I don't know, 25, 30 of them in, in the transcript, just to give you a flavour. Um, here, here are a few, a few of them. Um, 15 nuclear reactors shut down um, in, in various countries. Lots of credit card systems re rejected perfectly valid cards. Uh, an oil pumping station failed. Uh, there were power cuts in, in Hawaii. Uh, Kremlin Press Office couldn't send any emails. Uh, there were a number of people who, who uh, were charged 100 years interest on, on loans that they'd got, uh, and a few people who were actually given credit to, for 100 years interest on deposits that they'd got. Uh, I, I can imagine which, which of those problems the banks were quickest to sort out. Uh, an automated radio station in New Zealand kept playing the 11 o'clock news because it was always the earliest one. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and no, sorry, it was always the latest one because because uh, zero is is obviously a smaller number than, than eleven, and um, so it just kept repeating the same news news bulletin. Um, UK birth certificates started being printed uh, with with nineteen hundred as the date of birth. There were a whole range of these sorts of, of issues. Some of them pretty serious. Some of them completely trivial. Um, but it, it did give some indication of, firstly, how much had been fixed, but also how, how much had got through and how much could have gone wrong if, if the other fixes hadn't, hadn't occurred. So why, why wasn't it as bad as we feared? Um, the first thing to say is a huge number of errors had been found and fixed, an absolutely enormous number of errors had been found and, and corrected. So 
I think the first thing to say is, you know, well done to the teams of people who, who were working on it because it was a heroic effort. It was a massive amount of work and it did catch an awful lot of errors that would otherwise have occurred. We were very worried about the possibility of cascade failures, domino effects through supply chains. Um, they didn't occur, firstly because the big important supply chains tend to have the biggest companies in them and they were the people who were being most professional about their Y2K problems because they got the resources and, and because they got the biggest risk. So you know, not surprisingly they, they became the people who were taking it most seriously. Um, but also because actually the supply chains weren't as tightly coupled as we had feared. So there was redundancy built in. It was possible for a company uh, to, to fail to be doing something without having a major knock-on effect. And we'll come, come back to the implications of that in, in just a minute. The, there was a feeling at the time that the fact that the countries that had been lagging so far behind in their Y2K programs didn't seem to have massive problems and, and that meant that the countries that had been in the lead must have been wasting money because if the people who hadn't done as much got away with it then presumably we would have got away with it too. Uh, that, that's phony reasoning. What, what actually happened was that the, the leading companies firstly drove the suppliers to upgrade an awful lot of very widely used systems. And so a lot of latecomers were able to ride on the back of, of the first movers. Uh, and secondly, the consultancies and, and tool companies started to build a lot of automated tools. Uh, at, at, in the sort of early mid 90s, we, we calculated that it was costing between one and two dollars per line of code to, to um, make a, a program Y2K compliant, a typical commercial COBOL program. Um, and you know, that was a lot of money because these programs typically had, had hundreds of thousands of lines of code, certainly tens of thousands even in the little ones, hundreds of thousands in the, in the bigger ones. That was big money. By, we, we forecast that because of staff shortages, that was going to rise to $4 a line. And what actually happened was it went, went down dramatically to sort of 0.04 of a dollar per, per line of code because automated tools were, were created that were able to do a vast amount of the analysis and remediation automatically. And that helped enormously. And of course, it, it helped the latecomers to catch up. And the threat had to a degree, been exaggerated. It, it had been exaggerated, firstly, in order to, to drive awareness, because until you start making a fuss and, and talking dramatically, pe people weren't moving. Secondly, it, it had been exaggerated by companies that wanted to sell upgrades to, to systems. I mean, People, people were trying to, to force you. Uh, they were refusing to sign off as Y2K compliant systems that had never had a clock in them, that certainly didn't know what century it was, where nobody had ever entered a date into the system, and therefore the fact that the date was wrong couldn't possibly be an issue. You know, fan heaters, for example. Um, the, the, the big generators that were used at, at the West Drayton Air Traffic Control Centre, the big diesel generators, the, the consultants and, and equipment suppliers were trying to tell Nats they had to upgrade those because they might fail. It was all nonsense. It was rare that that happened in, in the big picture, but there was enough of it that it did give a... Uh, a bit of a factual basis to the claim that, that there was a, a bit of a scam going on. You know, people will exploit opportunities to make money, inevitably. And there were people who had their own agenda. And you saw the, the books at the beginning from the people who wanted to create a, a millennium scare um, for, for their own political or, or religious reasons or because they wanted to get headlines for their, for their particular organisation. So there was a degree of exaggeration. But actually the problem was a worldwide threat. And so it wouldn't be right, really, to say that, that the threat was exaggerated. In, in the main, it was, a, it was a genuine threat and it was right that the, the effort was mobilised to fix it, in, in my opinion. What did it cost? Um, lots of money. 
Um, not all of it wasted. You know, there, there were benefits. Um, the Indian software industry was basically created by this. I mean, there were a few uh, significant software companies in India at the beginning of the 90s. By the end of the 90s, they were you know, multi-billion pound multinationals because they would really managed to, to get hold of this problem. It was a perfect, perfect problem for, for outsourcing companies with, with lots of very, very bright people who would simply be perfectly happy to do what they were told and do a routine and fairly dull task over and over again on, on new programs. And it enabled them to grow massively. So you, you could put on the costs side that, that the West lost an awful lot of its competitive position against, against uh, places like India in the software business. Um, but of course, a lot of upgrades were done. New systems were put in. Um, systems that had longer life were, were introduced. So not all the work that was done was wasted by, by any means. And companies certainly learned a lot about their, their software inventories and, and where to find their, their source code and how important it was to have a bit more control and a bit more board oversight of, of the IT systems. Companies started to realise just how vital those systems were to their company operations. So there were, there were, some, there were some real benefits out of this. It wasn't, wasn't all wasted money. What about the lessons? Well, at the, at the heart of the problem was bad software engineering. Um, if we had used, if the programmers who had written these programs had been using techniques like abstraction and information hiding and object orientation and those sorts of ideas, which had certainly been around since the late 60s, then it would have been ever so much easier to change the date formats and, and not to have a, a major problem on our hands. Um, we haven't learned these lessons at all, in my view. And most software is still written very badly. Uh, I hope you'll come to my, my next lecture where I'll talk about how you make software correct by construction, because it is possible to write software so that it, you get it right first time. And there is significant evidence that it's cheaper to do that than to do what we're doing at the moment. Cheaper in terms of what it costs you to actually develop the software, never mind the, the continuing costs of, uh, of the software in the future. And some companies are writing software that way and, and are prepared to give guarantees and, and absolutely free uh, error corrections if, if anything goes wrong. So that, that's, that's a lesson which the industry has not yet learned and... Uh, and Maybe we can get the message across a bit in a month's time. The other major problem, of course, is that you know, testing is still the main way in which people try to determine that software is, is good enough to use. Uh, and yet we know from, from decades of experience that most defects cannot be found by any realistic amount of testing. It was a single point of failure. So one lesson we ought to have learned is we must avoid single points of failure. Things that where one thing could happen and they could cause lots of systems to fail at the same time. But we haven't learned that lesson yet. We've got GPS, which is a single point of failure for almost the whole of the economy in almost all countries around the world. It, it, it really is used spectacularly widely, not just for positioning, but for, for timing and for navigation, you know, detailed positioning and, and all kinds of things. Uh, I could, I could talk, talk for, for an hour about, about that problem alone. It is a major, major risk. But we, we do it with lots of other things too. We, you know, the the um, open source data, open data movement is making data sets available, very good thing, but nobody's curating them, nobody's guaranteeing that, nobody's checking or even trying to find out who's using these data sets because they, they are a single point of failure for, for everybody who uses them. And if there are enough of those and they interact in the wrong way, you've got a, the possibility of, of causing quite a serious problem if one of those data sets becomes corrupted. And we do exactly the same thing with software components as we saw with, with the Heartbleed bug in, in SSL, for example, just, just recently. 
lots and lots of people using the same modules in open source software, and if one of those is wrong, somebody puts up a version of it with Trojan code in, or somebody makes a serious mistake, then a lot of systems become vulnerable or, or fail uh, in, in lots of unexpected ways, potentially all at the same time. We learnt, or should have learnt, that redundancy is an important insurance method, and yet the, the um, just-in-time approach to supply chains, for example, and the way in which people do value engineering on, on processes and on equipment, squeezing out the redundancy in order to reduce costs, actually takes away that insurance. And we do need to be very careful about the way in which we value the insurance that redundancy gives, because we've got some benefits from it in, in Y2K. Our systems are much more tightly coupled now, and, and we're not, I think, properly assessing the risks from, from doing that. Um, Y2K showed that you really could motivate a lot of people very effectively through um, formal and informal regulatory means. There's no political appetite for, for using those sort of approaches to solve the cyber security crisis that we've, we've got at the moment, uh, or indeed the, the bad software crisis that, that we've got, which underpins that. And, and I think that's, that's a pity. We, we should have learned that it is possible to motivate and, uh, to, and, and mobilize and coordinate an international campaign to fix a serious problem that is going to affect everybody. So I conclude that, that Y2K wasn't a hoax or a, or a scam, um, that as I said at the beginning, it should be seen as a near miss and that we ought to learn the appropriate lessons from it. That the, the threats are greater today than they were then, and therefore, um, although we, we can't perhaps have, we haven't got the same deadline looming, it's harder to pin your an individual threat that is going to be the, the thing that causes a lot of systems to fail, the vulnerabilities are building up and because we're continuing to write lots and lots and lots of not very good software, the scale of that problem is just growing every year. And to get back to where I started, when you hear about Y2K it's usually um, people saying, oh we can't believe experts. Um, don't take any notice about, about climate change. Remember year 2000. Yeah, re remember year 2000. What, what do you think we should learn from, from year 2000? Thank you very much. <laughs>